why would a French atheist become a Christian? And what are some of the arguments and reasons that caused him to reconsider his belief system? And how has that transformed his life to today? Well, we're going to jump into a friend of mine, Guillaume Bignon, who's written a fascinating new book, thoroughly enjoyed, called Confessions of a French Atheist. Christians, you'll be encouraged. Uh, atheists or agnostics or anybody else, I think you'll be challenged, but also be pleased by the tone that he brings in this book. Very thoughtful, very interesting, very respectful. Guillaume, thanks for joining me on the show. Sean, thank you very much for having me and thank you for your kind words. Uh, yes, I try to write the book in such a way that uh, agree or disagree, you would enjoy the, the content and be entertained by the fun story and be challenged by the ideas. Well, I think you did that successfully. So let's jump in in many ways where you jump into the book at your childhood. Grown up, obviously, in France. What was your family and your childhood like? Uh, it was great. Uh, I grew up in a very loving family. I have uh, so two wonderful parents and uh, an older brother and a younger sister. And uh, we uh, were in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, and uh, we grew up so we grew up uh, nominally Catholic. So we were, we did go to mass, and we had some of, somewhat of that uh, religious background. But it wasn't extremely meaningful. Uh, and as soon as I was old enough to tell my parents I didn't believe this, that's kind of faded in the background. And um, that's we just stopped going to mass and my life was hardly changed in that respect so that, that wasn't a huge part uh, of my upbringing um, and then i was old enough to tell them look i don't believe this stuff i, I don't think there is a god and so I, that's i was an atheist from that point on um, but yeah I, I had a really wonderful upbringing uh, great parents great plenty of activities as a result uh, they would drive me to all sorts of sports and i did good uh, in school so i did my studies uh, ended up uh, playing uh, music as well. Uh, so a lot of activities looking for my own uh, fulfillment and happiness and uh, it worked out pretty well. So two part question, how old were you when you would define yourself as an atheist and how did your parents respond when you told them about this? Yeah, so it's hard to tell when exactly I would have put the word on it. I think it's pretty clear that from as early as I can remember being just autonomous about my decision to believe or not believe is probably as early as 12 years old, something like that. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily have put a label on there. Uh, I know that all religious practice sees mostly when we were uh, in high school. When we reached high school, uh, our parents kind of said, well, you know, you have the option, you do whatever you want there. And so we just exercised the option and said, no, we're not uh, going anymore. And I'm saying we, because my older brother had pretty much the exact same situation as I did. Oh. So he, he went first uh, a couple of years ahead of me and I joined and followed in those uh, steps. And we just were atheists and practicing atheists at that point. Uh, mm. We put our practice in line with our beliefs. So were you always just an inquisitive, thoughtful person? You're a philosopher now. You've written this great book. That's just part of your DNA. Because for somebody to say at 12, they kind of figured out what they believed is pretty young. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I would have thought uh, I have terrific reasons for what I believed at that point. Uh, I did... I think it's in the culture in France, uh, there was also an air of superiority uh, with scientific mm. pretensions uh, to think that uh, you know, belief in God is kind of superstitious. It, it's, it's for people who don't really think for themselves. It doesn't mean that it came with the heavy thinking on my own uh, against God's existence, but there was a little bit of that. So uh, I wouldn't have put my atheism in the category of things that would make me thoughtful or inquisitive. It was more okay. of a, well, I don't see any good reasons to believe this is real. I mean, this God, we, we can't see, we can't feel. There's no difference here. The universe feels just the same if there were no God. So let's just stop going to church and everything behaves exactly the same. That was kind of the mindset. And that was what led me to say, no, I'm, I don't believe this stuff. So another two part question for you, I know you can handle it, is uh, there's debate about what the word atheist even means. People understand it differently. So I'd be curious if you could define for us that. And you said you're a practicing atheist. So in your experience, what does it mean to practice atheism? Yeah, so the the definition of atheism, so I know that sometimes on the internet there's a bit of a debate. I, I understand it the way that uh, philosophers define atheism. Typically, it's the uh, maintaining the belief that there is no God. So it's a positive affirmation that there is no God. Uh, obviously, it follows from that. that uh, like, so 
a, a, an atheist uh, is not just making an ignorance claim, is making a positive claim to knowledge. Uh, but it's not it's not a big deal to me who has the burden of proof in those. It's simply, well, the theist says there is a God and the atheist says there is no God. Uh, and then the agnostic would say, I, I don't know, or maybe it's impossible to know. Uh, so I would place myself very much in the atheist category because I was not just saying I don't know or uh, you know who's to say I was really saying no I'm fairly convinced that there is no God so that, that would put me in that category and and sometimes uh, when people hear my testimony uh, it's not been rare unfortunately that people say oh he wasn't really an atheist to begin with mm. uh, which which always amuses me because I wonder what it would take to qualify as an atheist given that <laughs> I I did not have a belief that God exists. I had a belief that there is no God. And I believed that it was intellectual suicide to believe that there is a God. So uh, it's very antagonistic to theism. And I, I don't know what else you need. But basically, this is where I was. And this is where I would call myself an atheist. As to your second part question, uh, like what does it mean to be a practicing atheist? That was just my way of saying that I finally ceased practicing the Catholicism of my okay. childhood. So I stopped going to mass and now finally my practice was in line with my belief uh, or affirmation that there is no God. That makes sense. That That's really helpful. Now, one of the things about your story that amazed me pretty early when, when I heard it is just how motivated you were towards success. And I want to tell us a little bit about that, especially in your teenage years, in your 20s, because my daughter plays, she's 15 almost, and she plays pretty high-level volleyball, competitive, wants to play in college. So I just see what it takes to succeed on the level and even higher that you succeeded at. So just paint a picture for us watching of just the motivation and the hard work and the kind of person. I know you still are that to a degree today, but especially in your teens and your 20s, uh, what that was like for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I said I was involved in all kinds of sports. My mom very kindly, selflessly would drive us to all sorts of uh, of training, training um, like practices and, and games. Uh, I played a number of them and were not ever really strong at any of them until I tried volleyball. So volleyball was my sport. Um, and uh, yeah, when I, when that started to work out and I could tell that this was working, I mean, I, I also was not super tall until puberty hit and then it hit with a revenge and I grew to CCB six feet four and uh, mm. therefore um, the, the height was a, a factor for volleyball, but also just the, the sport clicked and um, there was a, a bit of a transformation. So this... Uh, you might appreciate this. So basically, my my childhood, I was pretty much fairly geeky, uh, fairly the the, the 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 cliches of the nerd you can imagine with the big glasses and the the uh, a student and uh, a little bit a little bit on the uh, geeky nerdy side. And uh, in France, that came with the concern that uh, I wasn't necessarily super popular with the ladies. And so uh, there, there was, all of that dynamic was present. And then all of a sudden, uh, puberty hit. The, the, like, I grew up to be super tall. I uh, started to lift weights. And it's kind of the, uh, the you might appreciate this as the comic uh, book fan that you are. Uh, it's kind of the Spider-Man. I just got stung by the, the radioactive spider. And now all of a sudden, like, this is a big metamorphosis. And I can be successful at this stuff. So, yeah, I started to uh, lift weights, uh, gain a lot of muscle mass. Uh, my vertical jump uh, went through the roof. And so I started to do really well at volleyball. And uh, I ended up playing in National League. So I would mm. travel around the country to uh, play the games on the weekends. And it was a, a big, uh, intense, competitive aspect. And it was, as fun as it was in isolation, it was also one ingredient in trying to be successful with women. So that was you know, trying to be popular, trying to be impressive. Um, in my quest, that was partly also to seek happiness and fulfillment by uh, mm. seducing women, which was a, a, an important ideal uh, as a young French atheist my age uh, at the time. I, I did note that you said you might appreciate this. And then your next comment was that you were kind of a geek and a nerd. <laughs> so I take that as a compliment. I'm not offended the, the, in case you're worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I get it. There's not a lot of people I meet that like love superhero stuff but then also sports. I didn't play as high level as you did, but I played college basketball and just competed and loved it and kind of have those two dynamics going on. Now, in, in your book, as you talk about this, you also mentioned that you're a rock star playing in a band and behind a lot of this was not just a love for competition, but really seeking happiness and meaning. Were you aware of that at the time 
Or is this something looking back you see with a new lens and realize, oh my goodness, here's why I was so into this? Yeah, so I, I was also playing the keyboard and I ended up playing with a band and writing our own music and starting to perform live. And that was very, very exciting for me. Um, uh, again, another avenue to search for my own happiness uh, and success. I wouldn't know that, I, I don't know that I would have been super reflective on like, why was I seeking for mm -hmm. this? And it seemed to me like the natural end is to like, let me seek for happiness. And those things seem to make me happy. So I'm going to run after them with a, a, a lot of uh, effort. Um, it's uh, it's only later on that, uh, it, yeah, that, that there was a, a moment of uh, a little bit more intellectual reflection on what am I doing here? Uh, it's And it came at the point where I felt like I had, I had achieved all of those uh, areas of success to me, um, with the, the volleyball, the studies, uh, the music. Uh, and at the time, I also ended up being in a pretty serious relationship with a, a girl that I thought was great. So all of those avenues in which I had tried to succeed seemed like they were coming into place. And uh, that gave me pause, uh, like in the success on all of those avenues mm. to wonder, well, OK, now I've I've reached the, the, the mountaintop I was uh, trying to reach. Uh, now what? And I wasn't too sure what uh, the whole thing was about, like what's happiness? Am I happy? Uh, I don't know. And so that led me to write an interesting letter to my grandfather, who was a very exceptional individual yeah. and I have respect for. And I asked, I wanted to ask him, like in, looking back at his very successful, very full life, like what's happiness? Like I have all this stuff that I've been running after and I, I don't really know if I, what direction I need to be running after now. And so that was kind of a, a, more, a more philosophically uh, oriented question that uh, I hadn't had before. And it was a, a good turning point in my, in my thinking, yeah. Now, you include that letter in your book. I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> How old were you again when you wrote that? And what did he say that maybe had some impact on you? Yeah, it's hard to know exactly when that was. It was probably my early 20s or, or very okay. late teen, early 20s. Uh, and what, what he responded was uh, interesting. Uh, he so he, he his his basic answer was that uh, happiness is not really uh, a place to reach and then stay at. It's kind of a direction. And then so he, he he saw a lot of our happiness as being milestones, like milestone markers. And you just you don't sit on the milestone marker. You keep going and you just celebrate that you've passed the milestone. Uh, that was kind of a nice metaphor, and uh, and I appreciated that. But what what was interesting is that he also had some religious components in there to explain, like uh, what was most meaningful to him. Uh, say, telling me of uh, reciting the uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, while in Israel on the mountain that very well could have been where Jesus pronounced those same words. Yeah. And so that was a very meaningful piece. And at the time, for me, it's like ah, gag me! I don't want any of this religious talk. Uh, why does he talk about religion when I'm asking for meaning and happiness? Uh, and I obviously, it's, in retrospect, it's kind of funny because I failed to see the connection that philosophers often draw between mm -hmm. objective meaning in life and the existence of God and his purpose for human beings as his creation. But uh, that was kind of a, a first connection point for me to realize my own experience, my, um, yes, my, my really existential struggles led me to raise questions about the goal of human existence and what I should be doing with my life. And then my grandfather talked about Jesus and I was like, hey, don't give me any of this stuff. Uh, let's, let's continue. And so I, I simply pursued uh, uh, my own uh, avenues again uh, without really asking too many religious questions. So is it fair to say while you're seeking being a rock star, playing volleyball, your life was largely happy, but there was, there was an underlying sense of angst or unhappiness. How, how would you describe that tension that you lived in? Yeah, so this was really the, the feeling that uh, I really wasn't running uh, after something definite at that point. I, I had a number of things that worked out really well for me. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I, was, I wasn't sad or, or depressed or anything mm. like that. Like, right? I, I, I find a lot of fulfillment out of those things that, that uh, felt quite great. But I could never really anchor them in something um, that would really put my soul at rest uh, to say, yes, uh, you're on the right path. You're doing what is good, what is planned for you or what is design. You know, like it, those, those sorts of things would require a designer and there was no such thing. So it seemed like I wasn't really anchored and I was pretty satisfied. But uh, it, it, there was something, some, some part of me uh, wondering, like, is, is there more to this? 
So let's go to the part where it started to change. Obviously, your grandpa left certain thoughts that were connecting things, but it didn't really start to change the trajectory of your life, as far as I could tell. Correct me if I'm wrong. But no, then that's right. a relationship with a girl started to shift things. And of course, all good stories involve some kind of relationship, or many of them do. Tell us about this part of your life. Yeah, so this is the part where the story starts to sound like a movie and I'm, I'm looking back and I'm still unsure, like, did that really happen? <laughs> but uh, this is really how it went. I went on vacation in the Caribbean, so it like starts with a trip uh, across the world uh, with my brother. Uh, we visited my uncle who had, in, uh, who had lived in the, on the island of St. Martin in the Caribbean. And then uh, there's one day where we went to a distant beach. Uh, we didn't have the car and we needed to come back to our house. Uh, and my brother out of the blue decided that we would be hitchhiking. And that was the very first time in my life I ever hitched height. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's the last time I did. Uh, but uh, comes that random occurrence uh, led us to, um, uh, to meet uh, a couple of American tourists uh, who were there. And it, they stopped when we were hitchhiking. And they were not even stopping to pick us up. They were stopping to ask for directions. Uh, <laughs> okay. and, and, and through a, a complete randomness, uh, again, uh, as a Christian, I look back and I see the providence of God. But uh, through a very fortunate coincidence, the, the hotel that they were headed towards was next door to the house that we were staying at. And so we gave the bargain, saying, you know, we'll tell you where it is if you pick us up and drop us <laughs> off. And so we got in, uh, and they were uh, very attractive American tourists. Uh, one of them was a former model. So uh, in that place, uh, I, we started to flirt and try to seduce the French accent kicking in. And uh, we made a, enough uh, success uh, during that car ride that... Uh, we reconnect we, that they gave us uh, contact information and that we reconnected and I ended up uh, dating the uh, one. So one was from Miami. The other one was from New York. So I ended up dating the one that was uh, from New York. And um, I unfortunately quickly discovered that she was uh, claiming that she believes in God, which again, to me was like intellectual suicide. I don't want to get back into this sort of uh, topics. And uh, also that attached to her belief in God was a belief that uh, you should abstain from sex before marriage, which uh, in my view at the time also was absolutely unthinkable. So there was two very strong strikes. Uh, and somehow, um, but I mean, she was extremely exotic. It seemed like the, the whole thing was like, uh, in a movie, uh, really, uh, the, the hitchhiking uh, adventure yeah. of the, the Caribbean. So I uh, decided, okay, well, let's let's still try to make this work. Uh, and so I we didn't I didn't like run away immediately. And I figured let's let's give this a shot, and we'll try to remove the barriers caused by her religious beliefs uh, by trying to explain to her that this is nonsense and that we should just be happy together. So that was my my outlook there uh, that started with this uh, very random hitchhiking adventure. So tell, tell me a little bit more about what that led to, because this kind of opened up the door, so to speak, to you start to rethinking certain things. So keep the conversation going, the relationship with her, what this did kind of on your journey to rethink God. Yeah, so I mean, the, I, I, the vacation ended, uh, I flew back to Paris and she flew back to New York and we were in this now long distance relationship, extremely problematic. And I figured that even if she were just right next to me, like we would not be together because of her religious mm -hmm. beliefs, which was a, a high problem for me. So I decided I would try to think a little bit about that to help her stop uh, <laughs> with the, the kind of uh, professions that she, she made. Um, and I realized that if I was going to um, refute her Christian beliefs, I needed to at least know a little bit what she believed. Uh, so this was kind of the turning point where I was uh, forced to pick up an old Bible and uh, figure out, okay, what is in there? What does she even affirm? And this was this led me to, again, uh, dusting off uh, an old Bible, opening up and read the New, the New Testament, which I started to do. Uh, and, and this is one of the surprise. The first surprises I had there is that I started to read the New Testament um, and, well, first of all, I, I also like I, I told, told uh, Everyone's like, I don't believe this stuff, but if I'm going to be like uh, looking into it, I'm, I'm a scientist, I can make an experiment. I like to see, okay, if there's a God, he's probably very interested in the fact that I'm looking into Christianity right now. And so I, I started to pray as an unbeliever, like just, hey, God, if there's a God out there, then why don't you mm -hmm. go ahead and reveal yourself to me? Uh, I'm open, so go ahead, uh, grab me. No, I wasn't 
very open, <laughs> but I figured it wouldn't stop God if he existed. So that's what I did. And I, and I opened up the Bible and I started to read uh, the New Testament. I started with the Gospels. And uh, this is where I was expecting fully to be bored, uh, just like I was in my childhood on the church benches, just not understanding any of this and feeling like I'm wasting my time. And on the contrary, what I read uh, in the Gospels was that uh, Jesus as a character, just as a human person, was fascinating to me. Uh, I, I, I discovered a guy who was really uh, very smart. We navigated in conversation in brilliant ways that uh, his enemies constantly tried to trap him uh, and he would just uh, escape uh, masterfully, uh, just uh, catching them in their own words. Uh, so it was kind of a, a, a compelling figure. Uh, and at the same time, he spoke of authority and saying that he was the, the son of God and that he the kingdom of God was ushered in by his very presence. And at the same time, he had the humility to uh, wash his disciples' feet. Uh, so it was a, a very ca captivating person that I discovered there. And it made me a bit uncomfortable um, because I realized that I didn't really have a good story for who I thought that Jesus was. Uh, so uh, the, the, the fact that he had changed the world, you know, I, even at the time, I, I was not at all believing that Jesus was complete myth, right? So I, I wasn't this far gone, even as an atheist. Uh, I, I believed reasonably that Jesus was a first century uh, Jewish traveler who had got disciples and, you know, taught some stuff. Uh, and I realized that, yeah, he, he changed the world. Clearly, there's an enormous amount of people who claim to follow him today. Um, and uh, also there was uh, the... You know, the stories about him claims that he performed miracle and ultimately was raised from the dead. And I, I was really wasn't sure what to make of those stories, uh, how I would account for them. So it, it's starting to make me a bit uncomfortable. And, and I knew that at some point I would need to have a good story about who I thought that Jesus was. Okay, so let's come back to who you thought Jesus was and how you worked through that. But I'm really curious how this exotic girl from New York would would date you but not have sex, why would she date a non-Christian if she had such convictions not to have sex before getting married? Was she missionary dating to see you come to faith? Like, what was her motivation in this? Yeah, so this is something that I wasn't super clear about when we started this uh, relationship. Uh, and then she visited me in Paris. Uh, and that's the point where I started to um, try to have like a conversation about religion and see where that would lead us. Uh, and I was hoping to start to tell her that, you know, like that she should really abandon all of this stuff because that's a waste of time. And I started like lowering the bar and I started to at least ask, okay, well, would you be okay with me at being an atheist if we were to get married mm -hmm. one day uh, and, and that you uh, are a Christian? And I thought this was a, an easy one for her to show a little bit of uh, tolerance. <laughs> and she said, no. And, and I was shocked. Like to me, this was, wow. this seemed intolerant. Like, whoa, whoa, I'm, re I'm prepared. Mm. I'm, I'm almost prepared to let you be a Christian and go to, to church and, and God knows what else. Uh, but if we were together and you're not willing to extend the same courtesy to me, it seems intolerant as a view of, uh, of marriage. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, it, it seems like it, it's indicating that she was pr probably hoping that I would become a Christian. But to me, that was an absolute deal breaker. It's never going to happen. Um, so I think that was the mindset. Now, frankly, I wouldn't recommend, like, like you said, like, oh, I, I don't understand. I, I frankly re recommend uh, if there's an American woman out there who is considering dating an atheist, thinking that, oh, well, you know, it happened with Guillaume Bignon. So maybe it's going to be the case. It doesn't strike me as wisdom. Okay. <laughs> so this is not okay. great. But in God's providence, it worked out really well and not for her. Uh, it's not like somehow I became a Christian and then everything was great together. Uh, the story goes a very different way and I'll let readers read the book. But uh, that's that's just one means that God used. Uh, and that's indeed not something I would recommend. OK, I won't steal all details because I want to read the book, which is awesome. But you didn't end up with her, at least in that piece. OK, no, no, no. All right. Fair enough. But you would say, looking back, that this was a part of the journey where God got your attention, got you to explore certain spiritual questions uh, along the journey. OK, so let's let's jump back into it. This stage in life, you realize, OK, maybe it's not going to work out with her. This is crazy that she wouldn't even be with a with an atheist who's OK with her being a Christian. Talk us through what happened next, either just where you were in your faith, your understanding of Jesus. What moved the ball forward for you? 
Yeah, so what moved the ball forward is that so when she came, uh, she had been given the address of, a, of an evangelical church in Paris uh, that in case she would uh, visit it while she was in France. Clearly, that wasn't going to happen on my watch. Like, uh, <laughs> and that was even <laughs> that wasn't concerned. That was also concerning that uh, she couldn't just stop going to church for a couple of weeks while on vacation with me. Wow. Uh, that would have been a big red flag. So uh, that didn't happen. Um, but somehow she had uh, consulted her emails from my computer and uh, the uh, address of that church was still accessible from my computer even after she left. So in my uh, investigation to try to uh, refute the Christian faith and kind of understand what she believes, uh, I secretly took that address and then figured if I'm going to be looking at uh, what she believes, I'd be curious to see what these guys do. Um, the interesting part in all this is that I couldn't even end up in church, even this one, uh, even if I wanted to, because at the time I was still playing volleyball games every weekend. So my weekends were taken by volleyball games traveling the country uh, to go and play in National League. Um, and this is the another timely, uh, interesting coincidence, which is that uh, very shortly after I, um, out of the blue, uh, I got an injury on my shoulder. Like there was no accident. Mm -hmm. Uh, but out of the blue, my uh, right shoulder, which is the dominant arm for spiking, started to burn. Uh, it just mm. burned out uh, 10, 15 minutes into every volleyball practice. And uh, I just couldn't spike. And so the, the uh, physical therapist uh, tried to help. The doctor couldn't see any problems and said, we don't understand what's going on. Uh, you probably just need to rest your shoulder. So you need to stop volleyball for a few weeks. And so now against my will, I was uh, available on Sundays. And this is how I ended up visiting that church to see what those Christians do when they get together. Very, very interesting. Okay, so I, I, I'm trying to picture this scene in Paris. This atheist who's questioning his faith and curious goes walking into a church. What did you see? What happened? What were your expectations? How did it meet your expectations or not? Like, take us through that experience. Yeah, it was very special. So... Um, I walked in and I was very awkward because uh, mm. for me, my mere presence in the building was already an, an intellectual suicide. Like what, what, mm. what am I doing here? Uh, I, I got a strong sense that if any of my family or friends would see me there in a wow. church, I would die of shame. Uh, so it was very, wow. very awkward. Uh, and I walked in and I, I noticed it was, this was very different from the uh, Catholic church that I grew up in. So there was no pipe organs or, or pews. Uh, it was a, a contemporary band on the, on the stage uh, and just regular chairs. And also people were uh, standing up. I think it was the beginning of the, the uh, service. So it, was, it has not started yet. It had not started yet. And they were still standing up in small groups. And uh, somebody just said, hey, come here. We're going to pray. Ooh. Uh, that seemed weird to me, so, but I figured, okay, if I stand up in silence, you know, that's not going to hurt. I'm going to see what they do. And uh, so they kind of bowed their heads and they were praying. And I remember thinking, hey, this is interesting. They're praying like there's actually somebody listening on the other side, uh, wow. which was new to me because to me, prayer seemed like a rec recitation, uh, you know, like you recite a prayer and that's it. And here, these people really seem to be talking to a God that they thought was really there. So that was a, a bit exotic, uh, but mostly I was I was very awkward. So uh, I ended up sitting down uh, when the service started. Uh, I remember enjoying the music; like the musicians were really good. Uh, obviously, I couldn't sing because of the religious lyrics, but uh, the, the the music I thought you know I, as a musician I could recognize that sure. some of them were really good. Uh, I think the bass player was a professional, so it was really impressive and really, really good stuff. Uh, but I, I just sat there to, to kind of see what happens. And then the, the sermon came, uh, the, the pastor um, just delivered his sermon. And I don't remember at all what he talked about, which is kind of an interesting piece that I, I have completely blanked on the mm. content of what he talked about. Uh, so either because I was completely absorbed in my thoughts that uh, you know, I shouldn't be there or simply it's just I, I forgot that I don't remember a word that he said. Um, but he finished his uh, sermon, and I, at the end, I thought, well, okay, I've seen enough, uh, so I need to escape <laughs> so that I don't have to introduce myself <laughs> to anyone else, and I don't have to have awkward conversations. And so I jumped on my feet, and I walked back uh, down the aisle uh, to the exit door at the end of the church, and I reached the uh, door, and I opened it to escape, and I literally had one foot out the door when there's a big blast of chills that stopped me in my track, came in my chest and went up my throat and grabbed me. And I was frozen on the doorstep. 
um, and I goose, goose bump, like really a strange experience. Uh, and I heard myself thinking, this is ridiculous. I have to figure this out. Uh, and so I, was, I did a complete uh, 180. I closed the door, turned around, and I went to the head pastor and I introduced myself. And I said, so you believe in God, huh? <laughs> and so the, pastor, <laughs> the, the, the pastor looked at me and was like, yeah, um, uh, and we can talk about it. Uh, and he said, you know, we can make an appointment and uh, come in and chat. Um, and I said, all right, fine, uh, let, let's do this. And so I made an appointment. And years later, he told me that he really didn't expect me to ever show up. Uh, oh, but wow. somehow I did. And so uh, I, I showed up and uh, and walked into this uh, pastor's office uh, a few days later. All right. Now, obviously, I've got to follow up and find out what happened. You walk in this <laughs> pastor's office. Was there a part of you that was like, that experience made you think, not only do I need to give this a second look, but at this point, are you thinking, maybe this is true or am I skipping ahead too much? Well, I, I do need to give a second look. I don't think I would have said maybe this is true at this point. Okay. Uh, I think I was very curious to at least see genuine people really believing this mm. stuff because it still seemed to me like those beliefs were out of this world. Uh, so to, to see some people who actually believe it, I was just curious. There was maybe a bit of morbid curiosity, like, oh, this is insane. What are these guys okay. doing? So I wanted to see and understand, like, what are they, what, what do they believe? Like, do they, do they think they know anything that I don't? Uh, so th there was the, a bit of that curiosity there. Uh, this experience uh, to catch me at the door, obviously, in looking back as a Christian, I think was incredible. Uh, on the moment, I feel like, I didn't really ask myself, like, where is the source of this thing? Like, where, why is this blast just gotcha. kept me by the, the throat? Uh, and, you know, I could, could dismiss it as, like, as just a fluke event. So I didn't really focus on that too much. But it, the timing is certainly remarkable and looking back. So the sermon, for some reason, escaped your mind. Do you remember this conversation with the pastor, what questions you had and how it went? Yeah, so the yes, I, I showed up in his office uh, a couple of days later. Uh, and it was great. Uh, I was basically trying to understand what Christians believe. Uh, and he was, uh, it was great. He was an American uh, missionary in, in France. So he has, he had been in France for many years uh, and spoke French uh, fluently with a bit of an American accent and it was uh, fine. He was roughly the age of my dad. Um, and um, he very was very curious to hear why I was even showing up. Like, sure. what was my interest in all this? So I kind of told him my story on my vacation and the, the girlfriend and the weird beliefs and, and my curiosity. Uh, and uh, and we had a really good conversation about like what Christians believe, uh, God, and uh, how that works out in practice and what that would do for our relationship. Um, and and so what I, what struck me is that here was a guy who was clearly educated, who was stable, mm. who was you know smart, uh, could have a meaningful conversation and yet he really believed that there is a god who created the universe and that jesus was the son of god who was raised from the mm. dead and so that contrast between the the educated and meaningful and intelligent person and the beliefs that seemed crazy to me um really was a a big challenge uh, so that was a, a first turning point to realize hey this is actually somebody who's sensible about this uh we can have some good conversations and that did start a range, uh, like a, a set of conversations for the next several months uh, where I would come and ask my curious questions and we would talk. Oh. And uh, he didn't necessarily present a positive apologetic uh, in the way that you or I would do today when asked, OK, what are, what are the positive reasons to believe in Christianity? Sure. But he was answering my questions at least coherently within his own worldview. And that was already uh, impressive enough for me that he had mm. some consistent uh, way of, of viewing the, the the data and to express his uh, his faith in uh, in Christ. So that, that made for a long exchange uh, during which a lot of my questions were tackled. Um, also, I was trying to understand Christianity, and he gave me a small booklet that he had written that was very helpful to explain um, like what the basics of the faith are. Uh, and so, it, and it asked a question and then gave a Bible reference uh, for us to go and pick up the answer from the Bible directly. So he gave me this and I figured, all right, this is a good exercise. I'm going to do this. So I went home and I did this uh, very carefully. Uh, I would get the response, but then I would have another question that pops up. So I would write the questions. And so my notes ended up being a pile of questions that I would then bring to my next meeting mm. with him and to discuss some of those. Uh, and it, it made for a number of fun conversations. 
One of the topics you mentioned earlier was the issue of sexuality, and you hint at this in your book a little bit, that you thought it was crazy, a Christian would say, not to have sex before marriage, and even describe your life before. Some of the volleyball gave you the ability to to woo women in a way you hadn't before, so I know that was a, a barrier, at least an issue to you. How did you work through that question? Yeah, this was really a big sticking point. Uh, to me, the Christian view that uh, you should not have sex before marriage was just old fashioned, like repressive. Uh, it seemed like anti sexuality. And the idea that uh, a Christian should not be married to a non Christian, that seemed intolerant. So there was like those mm. barriers. Uh, there. And so uh, this is a topic on which that pastor really navigated the conversations brilliantly because it was a minefield for me. Uh, And yet he really approached this very sensibly. Um, He made clear, so it it was obvious that he believed those things and that uh, therefore my own moral choices were very different. Uh, And yet he never felt like he was condemning me. Uh, Like it's very, very friendly, very welcoming, uh, but just defending the, the beauty of his own view. Uh, and and he was able to paint a pretty attractive picture. So uh, in terms of the um, intolerance of not marrying a Christian, he was able to very meaningfully explain that if you are becoming a Christian, then God and Jesus become the very center of your life. This is really an identity thing. And this is going to educate m- almost all of the major life decisions that you're going to make. So just purely practically speaking, to have a, a couple, like a married couple, where they disagree on this most fundamental of thing is is not a good idea to enter a marriage. And so I, I was able to understand that this was not intolerance. It was just good wisdom practically for a good mm. marriage. And then with re- the issue of uh, abstinence, clearly this was not a choice that I was prepared to make at all. Uh, but there was a bit of a, of a contrast between the, pe- the picture that he was painting and my own um, moral life and, and view of relationships where it had been a train wreck, where I had uh, started to really seek women and I cheated on every single relationship I had. I lied wow. to cover up my tracks. So my track record on that liberal end of the uh, spectrum was not working. It was clearly something that I, I realized some some change mm-hmm. needs to happen there. I clearly wasn't prepared to think of abstinence before marriage, but sure. the picture as a result that he was painting was somewhat attractive. And I remember something that was uh, even crazier than this. He said that uh, in his own life, he... Um, uh, so he was married to uh, the, the worship leader uh, in, the, in the church. So his wife was the one playing the, 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 the keyboard. So I remember seeing her on the stage and uh, connecting the dots. And he said that they were married uh, and they had not even kissed before marriage, which wow. I completely could not process. <laughs> <laughs> this was absolute madness to me. Um, but somehow uh, the way that he talked about it was fairly touching because it made something mm. really special out of the idea that they, were, they, they, are, they had their first kiss after the traditional words of you may kiss the bride. Uh, and so there, there was something beautiful there. I, I, was, I thought clearly not for me, but he was able to paint an attractive picture and that started to diffuse a little bit my apprehensions against that. That's so, so interesting. Now, one, one of the other barriers that you talk about was, especially with your background and your interest in science, that Christianity felt anti-science to you. And you talk in the book a little bit about topics of evolution that you worked through. How did you work through that barrier? Yeah, so uh, the idea of science was important for me, and this is something that I started to reflect on in my conversations with the the pastor. Um, The expectations I had at the time was that somehow science should be able to prove that God exists, and that if it it couldn't, Mm. then this was a reason to think that God does not exist. Um, And and a bit more of reflection on that uh, made me realize that this is actually a completely unreasonable standard for believing something, Mm. that there are plenty of things that we believe from what science tells us, but there's also plenty of things that we believe and know to be true while they are not delivered by sciences. So this is fairly trivial, but lots of things about us in the real world uh, are simply not delivered by the natural sciences. So maybe God's existence could be known in different ways than just listening to Mm. natural science. Uh, And then I I try to reflect a little bit on my own scientific knowledge. So I had studied physics and biology uh, in uh, high school and college uh, to to certain levels. Um, And I try to reflect, okay, I've been assuming that somehow the science and God are at war with each other. Uh, It's something I probably picked up in the overall culture uh, in France. 
uh, and I realized, okay, well, well let's let's dive in. Like, what are the scientific beliefs that I allegedly have you know, in my all of my scientific knowledge? Uh, what do I know that actually conflicts with God's existence? And I did a little bit of an inventory and realized that very few, if any, of the beliefs I had uh, from science actually were even relevant to God's existence. Uh, huh. A couple of them, so maybe views about the Big Bang would be relevant, and maybe the theory of evolution. Uh, so th these might have some bearing, but uh, I realized there was no strong reason in my knowledge to deny God's existence. And I realized that there was no need to have a positive scientific case for God's existence in order to know it, because there's plenty of other things that we know without scientific evidence. Um, more specifically, the issue of uh, evolution, this is more something that kinda, I resolved a bit later. Um, I, let's not dive into too many of the specifics. This can be thorny. Uh, sure, but the, sure. the, the, the two pieces that I would simply say quickly is that for evolution to count against God's existence, you need two things. You need one to establish that evolution is incompatible with God's existence. Okay. And then you need to establish that evolution is true. Right? So if you have those two things, then it follows that God's existence is uh, refuted. And uh, my bottom line is that there are very sensible ways of avoiding both of those premises. You can, uh, there are plenty of Christians who believe that uh, the, the theory of evolution, at least some version of evolution is fully compatible with God's existence and God would just be driving the evolutionary process to create. Uh, and then there's plenty of Christians who are not convinced that the standard Darwinian theory of evolution as it currently stands is correct. And there are some sensible ways of rejecting that as well. So it seemed like there were options uh, and plausible ones that made it not crazy to believe that God exists, uh, whatever we believe about evolution. It, it sounds like if I'm tracking correctly, first you think this is crazy, and then you're having these barriers removed. And the way you frame that is, all right, this is not a reason to not believe. What started yeah. to push you positively towards believing? Was it evidences? Was it apologetics? Was it just the person of Jesus that was compelling? And obviously, somebody watching this, you and I believe that the Holy Spirit is present acting in that way, so I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying from your experience and what you understood at the time, what started to move you in a positive direction? Yes, uh, I think that's one of the positive pieces of apologetic that, well, I guess call it apologetic or call it good reasons to believe. Uh, but was one of the pieces that started to push me positively was my reading of the New Testament indeed. Mm -hmm. When I started to realize that uh, this account I was reading was people testifying to what they claim to have witnessed. Like they said, you know, we have seen Jesus. He's done that. We were there. We interviewed the witnesses. So they were giving an account. Now, obviously, they, they could be mistaken. They could be lying. They're, sure. they're, they're, there's ways to avoid that. But I do at least realize, okay, this is the kind of stuff that I'm reading right now. People who are seriously saying, we are writing those things to you so that you may know what happened and that believing in this, you may have life. And that's kind of the, the, the wording of John, at least. And Luke says, we've investigated, we've spoken with the eyewitnesses and the ministers of the word. So they're, they're, they're in the business of telling you, this is what happened, and it's really important. And in my own intellectual thinking, uh, that aspect came, became very important when I realized that... Uh, you have plenty of things uh, like I was basically hoping for absolute certainty. If I were able to mm. ever believe that God exists, I was hoping for certainty that, okay, this is undeniable. And I realized there's actually plenty of things that we know in life for which we have much less than certainty. But what we have right. is a testimony and testimony as a reliable way of form no forming knowledge was something that I really was a big uh, a click, a big click in my mind. It was a, a, just a, a big change i realized okay i know my name i know my date of birth i know things that happened before i was born you know in my family i know that my older brother was born with a c-section and that he came out blue like a smurf because the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck wow. i know all those things i know them full well it's not just that i have blind faith that they are true i know that they are true and how do i know all of those things because someone who knew told me it's <laughs> fairly straightforward. And so once I realized that there was plenty of things and fundamental things about myself that I knew 
with that kind of uh, a mechanism of simply a testimony of somebody who reliably tells me this is what happens, I realized that the gospels that I was reading really identify themselves as that and that it wouldn't be necessarily crazy to think, yes, this is true and they saw it and they are telling me. Now, obviously, you don't want to be gullible and just say, well, I'm sure. going to just believe sure. anything that anybody says. So it is going to be a question of accepting, like, is this reliable testimony or not? And we can discuss whether that is reliable. And you know, sure. this is what I do in the book to discuss the apologetic. But at least there's nothing um, uh, wrong about the mechanism itself of acquiring knowledge simply from somebody who knew something and tells you that it's true. And you see their testimony, it's reliable, and you form knowledge. And now you know. So they knew, they told you, and now you know. And there was a bit of simplicity there, but it's definitely a mechanism that intellectually convinced me that, uh, yes, I, I can do this. I, I, can, I can affirm that those things happen, and this is not crazy. Tell me if I'm, I'm capturing this correctly. You and I both have philosophical training, so maybe we think in similar terms. But as, as I hear you tell the story, it sounds like you came in to examining this Christian faith with certain epistemological assumptions, namely assumptions about what could be known. And one of the assumptions was science can prove God. And then when you reconsidered that, it was like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I'm approaching the intersection of science and faith uh, in an improper fashion. And then it came to God. You're like, I'm expecting certainty. It was kind of like, okay, wait a minute. That's not a reasonable expectation. Is it fair to say that you went into this investigation with Christianity with a whole bunch of assumptions you might not even been aware of, and then it was rethinking those assumptions, reframing your expectations, and then you just analyze the evidence differently? Is that fair? That's that's exactly right. And obviously, at mm -hmm. the time, I would not have put that kind of label on this to say sure. that I had a certain epistemology, but that is exactly right. I had expectations about what would count as reasonable knowledge, and I realized that these expectations were completely unreasonable and mm -hmm. were even incoherent in themselves uh, because, you know, certainty, again, this is you cannot be certain that you need to be certain. So this is self-refuting. <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, same thing with scientism and the idea that you need to have scientific knowledge before you can know something. Well, you cannot have scientific knowledge of that. So realizing that those standards were not just unreasonable, but were even incoherent was a big turning point in my thinking and it allowed me to reassess the evidence and to say, yeah, this passes muster. This is really good and this is actually intellectually reasonable. Now, mind you, it's not sufficient to make me a Christian at that point. Uh, gotcha. But I'm starting to realize, okay, there is intellectual credibility and it's not an intellectual suicide to accept the testimony that I was reading that presents itself as a historical record of what really happened to Jesus. Hmm. I have so many more questions about your story and the way you analyzed evidence, but people are going to have to pick up a copy of your book. Let's shift and kind of that point where you're like, okay, I think I'm a Christian. And I ask this just for clarity because I don't remember that point. I grew up in a Christian home, went through a doubting season, but I don't remember having this moment. Whereas my dad, who has a dramatic story of trying to disprove Christianity, remembers being in a library in London and what time it was when he had the thought of like, oh my goodness, this is true. So without any expectation that it has to be dramatic or not, do you kind of remember that moment? And what was it like when you're like, wow, I think Christianity is true and maybe I want to become a Christian. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the quarter dropped for me when the intellect mm. con connected with the emotions uh, because mm. there was a very important question that needed to be addressed, which was I, I didn't understand the gospel. Um, to, at that point, you know, I told you about all those notes and questions that I had. Uh, and it's so interesting that uh, I still have those notes uh, here at home, uh, written in French. And uh, I, I looked at them. There was a, one question that uh, appeared all over the place that you can see at almost every other page that I just did not understand. And the question was, why did Jesus have to die? I didn't understand the, this this question like, wait, okay, he died on the cross. What's the connection between that and my life as a Christian if I were to become one? I, it just didn't register. And the way that uh, the, uh, the quarter dropped is that um, in the process of this investigation, when my intellectual barriers started to be removed, uh, exactly at the same time, I came to commit some really horrible uh, moral failure uh, that had to do basically with cheating on this girlfriend, but with very sordid, aggravating circumstances that I'm not disclosed here. Uh, but basically, I did some really messed up uh, and uh, I had covered that with lies in order to not you know, be exposed. Uh, and the 
uh, way that God has uh, then revealed himself to me in that uh, place has been to reactivate my conscience. So I was, mm -hmm. my intellectual barriers were starting to shift. And then all of a sudden, uh, what, I, what I was trying very hard to suppress, you know, by having covered it with lies and to just hide it from the world was just shoved in my face. And I, I don't remember exactly how that grew. And so I know, I know where I was. I was in my apartment uh, in the suburbs of Paris, but uh, I was afflicted by painful mm -hmm. guilt, like a very strong feeling of guilt. And this is funny because sometimes when we talk about guilt, uh, we think this is inappropriate, like this is a bad thing uh, that you, because you should not be feeling guilty all the time or you should not feel guilty for things that you're not actually guilty of. But in my case, I was feeling guilty because I was guilty. <laughs> so sure. It was a, a very appropriate, uh, but it was it just came in full blast. And I was really afflicted by this. I realized, OK, I've messed this up. I've done this. It's horrible. And I've done it. And there's no going back. There's no erasing it. And it's, it's in that place of pain that I realized, okay, that that's actually what I'd been reading about. This is the deal. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for that very thing. He paid the penalty for my sins. And so this exchange, which is really the heart of what I take to be the Christian gospel, that Jesus pays the penalty on the cross for the sins we commit. And when we repent of our sins and trust him, place our faith in him, we receive forgiveness for those sins that we've performed. And we have eternal life, not by our good works, but by our faith in Jesus. And so that message came and made complete sense of my current uh, situation, my and my feeling of guilt, my uh, for my being guilty. And I realized the Christian answer, the Christian gospel is the answer. And this is one that I embraced immediately and said, okay, intellectually, it's not a suicide. Uh, experientially it, it explains exactly where i'm at and this mm. is the solution so i pray to god and in that place and say all right i'm all in uh, i i trust you you wow. save me <laughs> you, you forgive me uh and and here i was uh made it a commitment uh between god and me uh, just alone in this apartment um and the the guilt definitely uh was addressed like immediately i i sense okay i'm i'm at peace with god i've, I've encountered the living god and mm. i'm at peace with him from when the moment you walked into that church to the moment that you're just describing now this this evening, how long was that season? That was several months. Uh, okay. I, I can't quite pin down exactly the dates, sure. uh, but that was uh, several months, yeah. How, how is your life different? You described feeling a sense of the guilt going away, but not yeah. necessarily overnight, but looking back on that number of years ago today, this sense you talked about a lot, like this just yearning for happiness and this unsettling feeling in your life. Is that honestly gone or what's your life different now that you're a believer? Yeah, yeah. So that, that the guilt uh, went, uh, so it, it went away to some degree on the moment uh, when I felt mm -hmm. that I had peace with God. Uh, and then obviously there was the confessing to human beings uh, part uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, that involved minimally cheating on that girlfriend. So I needed to actually see what I would do now in the relationship. Would I confess that what I had done and seek her forgiveness? Uh, and so that part uh, came only uh, a couple of weeks later because this is actually the time where now I was planned to fly to New York and visit her for the first time. And so I was now facing the decision, am I going to confess uh, to her what I have done and probably break our relationship or um, like, live with this as a secret like i was very confused very uh yeah very very torn about this uh and this is only in the context of communicating with her that the the final remaining pieces of guilt needed to be addressed now i won't spoil the outcome of that conversation right, and the, right. the vacation for the reader uh this okay. is all uh, explained what happened there um but that that certainly was the the final stages after that uh the, the guilt of, of what i had done was completely gone i my conscience was clear uh and i re really experienced this spiritual renewal of knowing that uh, I'm, I'm not perfect i'm not morally good and my past is, is full of things that i regret and i'm guilty of but uh the the slate has been cleaned uh, i am forgiven and i have experienced and i am in a relationship with the living god and so it was a huge deal and it was a, a very very freeing moment uh mm. freeing season of realizing this is this weight of my shoulder has been lifted off and so that, that was a great period uh what 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 do i make of the um 
the, the drive to accomplish and to, to, to seek happiness, that certainly has uh, faded. Uh, the, the idea mm -hmm. that I, I, I've got a sense that I was walking in purpose for what God had for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And through through the years, so you know, again, I, I'm not spoiling the whole story, but I ended up in the process, I ended up moving to the US, uh, being working in uh, New York, uh, and I ended up uh, also in seminary. Um, so I, I started studying those things a little bit more seriously. Uh, this was the time where I started to explain to my family and friends why I hadn't lost my mind. And so I was uh, curious to offer good reasons, uh, you know, for the Christian faith and defend my views uh, against their objections. And uh, I, since I had no friends uh, in the U.S., no uh, volleyball team or music, uh, no nothing, I was fully available to just spend all of my time studying those things. And I was just devouring books and DVDs and documentaries and mm. uh, I didn't realize if I'm going to be sp studying all of those things, I might as well do it seriously and get a degree. And so that's that's how I, like I ended up applying in a seminary. Uh, and I went and uh, studied uh, and got a master's in New Testament studies uh, and then later on a PhD. So that's that's how I ended up being active in that field. Uh, but to to wrap up on this idea of pursuing success and, you know, like pursuing happiness. Uh, I've had plenty of personal pursuits and projects, and this has been an incredible ride. I mean, some of the fact that I'm talking to you, the fact that I have books coming out, that I am speaking at conferences alongside some of the folks that I consider like they were my heroes and now they are colleagues. So lots, lots of very exciting life developments have happened since then, none of which have felt like they're defining me uh, or that they are necessary conditions for my own happiness. And so there's been a sense of relaxing and finding the peace that I'm walking in God's purpose, that I know where I, that I am, where I ought to be, and it feels wonderful. One of the fears you expressed when you first walked into church is that your family and friends would see you and think that you had just gone crazy. Uh, without telling the whole story, did the way people respond when you finally came out as a Christian, did they respond the way expected? What is Was it different? What were some of the ways family and friends responded to your pretty radical conversion? Yeah, there was very different uh, responses uh, from different places. Uh, mm -hmm. So some some of which I expected, some of which I didn't. Uh, so some thought that, yes, I had completely lost my mind and they were very, <laughs> very concerned for me. Um, and, you know, as a testimony of their love for me, too, like they really thought that maybe I had joined the cult or that I, I just I'd gone completely rogue on them. So there was a lot of exercise there to try to convince them that, no, it's still me. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still the guy you know. It's just that this incredible thing has happened to me. And yes, I have some pretty strong, strong different beliefs, uh, but I'm still, you know, like as friendly and we're still connected and like, I, I haven't gone anywhere. So trying to re reconcile that. Uh, and then some others uh, who were actually surprisingly happy about that happening to me, even though they didn't necessarily share those beliefs. Okay. Uh, so I've, I've got a kind of a mixed bag, uh, and I've and I've dealt with uh, all of them as uh, as I needed. That that's totally fair. I, I appreciate that perspective. Well, Guillaume, last question. You've kind of hinted at it this through the interview, but I love your book. I think it's great. Tell viewers what they might expect if they read it. Who'd you write it for? What's it about? Go. Well, I wrote it for a number of people and I tried to put uh, enough in there that it would appeal to a number of folks. Uh, I think that Christians can be encouraged uh, mm -hmm. to see the story of maybe somebody who was, you wouldn't have bet that they would become a Christian. Uh, and so the, a, a nice story of God just reaching out against the odds and then uh, sovereignly saying, okay, you're mine. Uh, so that can probably mm -hmm. provide some encouragement for them to continue to pray and witness to others that they think are too far gone and are actually really ready to be grabbed by God. Uh, for the uh, skeptics, uh, I, I would say there's a, a challenging content that it's a, it's a story that reads like there is a God that's actually driving all of this uh, and that it's an interesting um, you know, piece of data for them to consider. And I also discussed a lot of the objections, intellectually speaking, that I had, that I dealt with, uh, that uh, all throughout the story, there's a bit of uh, intellectual conversations uh, peppered onto the yeah. fun uh, autobiographical conversation. So there's intellectual challenges there and an, an invitation, really. Uh, you know, it's an invitation to say, look, if, if I was an atheist and believed this was uh, really intellectual suicide and then through all of this came to appreciate, no, this is a completely different perspective. And I was convinced uh, there's substance there and I would invite them to give it a, a, good, uh, a good look. Um, and then uh, I would say that the book is also written to appeal uh, in, in two ways. So the, there's the intellectual component uh, with the apologetic that's accessible. So I, I try to not go into 
technical scholarly language, but I sure. do present faith in the, the defense of the faith, but it's also wrapped in a, a fun, entertaining story. So it makes for almost a, a, take, a book that you can take to the beach and uh, read a fun story yep. that has uh, world travels and betrayals and relationships and, and uh, <laughs> unexpected meetings and, and, uh, and long conversations and life-changing decisions. So all of that makes for kind of an entertaining read. And I'm hoping that people get touched by the, the whole package, the apologetic and the story. Well, if they read it, they will. As I was prepping for this, I was thinking of my daughter, again, who's almost 15, just kind of the volleyball angle. And, you know, we have these kind of conversations as well. I'm going to give her a copy and encourage her to read it and hopefully maybe maybe chat with her a little bit about it. But it never felt preachy to me, which I appreciate. And I'm a Christian, so maybe an atheist would feel differently. I don't know. But it didn't feel that way to me. You're just telling your story. Here's barriers you had to faith, science, sexuality, evolution, the reliability of the Gospels, resurrection of Jesus, and how you reconciled it and ultimately came to faith. So it's not a threatening book, but it's a piercing book where you really deal with the big questions, I think, in an honest, straightforward way through your story. So I'm more than happy to uh, recommend it to viewers, wherever you're coming from, Confessions of a French Atheist. And it's short. That's because you're a philosopher. So you get, you let the drama build, but you get to the point and you make, you don't waste time and you move on. So it is a book you can read at the beach, read in the airplane. Uh, it's not a 700 page Harry Potter book. So Hang on for a minute afterwards. I want to say thanks, but the book is fantastic. For the rest of you watching, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other interviews coming up just like this that will encourage you, I think inspire you, and challenge you. And if you've thought about studying apologetics formally, like Guillaume and I have, we would love to have you at Biola. We have the top-rated program. It's totally a distance program. I'd love to have you in class. I teach a full class on the resurrection, on the problem of evil, biblical sexuality, on and on information is below we'd love to have you in the program guillaume again thanks so much for joining me and i pray that just this book sells a ton of copies just because i think it's really well done all right thank you so much sean it's been such a pleasure